All right, so it's uh, 12.45. So I think um, we are scheduled to begin the second in the science working group uh, report outs. Um, and in this session, we have, uh, we have Rob Fender, who will be telling us about uh, transients. Uh, we have uh, uh, Andre Lobanov, who will be telling us about uh, New Horizons. We have Don Pesci, who will tell us about algorithms. And we have Peter Gallison, who will be telling us about history, philosophy, and culture. Uh, I will give everybody a, a two minute warning at uh, 10 minutes, and I'm, I'm gonna try to keep us uh, roughly on time. I realize that's always a challenge and, and I don't always set a good example. But uh, with that, Rob, uh, do you wanna get your slides up and no, fantastic? Hopefully, hopefully you can see my first slide now. So- um, I, I can, great. take it away. Thanks. So the, the Transients Working Group is a working group which is coordinated by myself and, uh, and Daryl Haggard. We have had two meetings uh, to date and the aim is to have monthly meetings uh, at the present time, maybe increasing the cadence a bit when we come to developing engineering requirements uh, in the new year. But at the moment we have a group of about 30 or 40 people, about 20 or 30 or about 20, 25 or so uh, join the the Zoom meetings that we have. Um, and so far in the meetings, our goals have been uh, to try and develop use cases, which we can feed back to the telescope. And the reason for that is that some of the modes which we're interested in, such as rapid response um, and flux monitoring with possibly a subarray of the telescopes might be quite different um, to the other, the requirements of the other working groups, which will be focused largely, I think, on stat more or less static imaging. Um, so what does transient stand for, for uh, uh, in terms of the NGHT? So in the context of NGEHT, transients essentially means, uh, it largely means stellar mass objects. So we're interested in stellar mass black holes. So these are black holes in X-ray binaries, gamma ray bursts, gravitational wave burst, merger events. Um, they're relatives in supernovae um, and other flavors of supernovae, for example, fast blue optical transients, um, and also sort of uh, peripherally within our remit are tidal disruption events, which of course a lot of people uh, are interested in. Our science aims are very similar, or the, our science interests are very similar to those of many of the other working groups. Our members are interested in the processes of accretion, how that connects to jet formation, how the jets propagate through their, their local medium once they're launched and how much power they're carrying. Um, we can do our science both through direct imaging, which is similar to what everybody else is doing with uh, NGEHT, but we can also do a significant amount of science actually with just sub-millimeter flux monitoring using perhaps a subset um, or even sparse imaging using a subset of the NGEHT antennas, if that's something which is uh, feasible from an engineering viewpoint, which we, we think it should be. So this is, uh, this is a figure of radio transients parameter space. So essentially what you're seeing here on the x-axis is time scale. And the middle point here at 10 to the zero, you can just essentially read this as seconds. So this is a time scale of about one second here in the middle. To the right of it is slower events, which typically are observed in the image plane and to the left are pulsar um, and uh, other coherent sources. Um, the AGN in the top right-hand corner, the, the cyan region, denotes the region um, which is constrained to be at a brightness temperature less than 10 to 12 Kelvin, which means that essentially all of the sources in here are consistent with being synchrotron. Some of the AGN and GRBs poke a little bit out of this region because they're Doppler boosted towards us. So the, the primary goals of the EHT are of course the, the AGN sitting in the top right hand corner, the most luminous um, and nearest uh, AGN, the, the big example so far being Sagittarius A star and M87. The region of this parameter space that we're looking at in the transients working group um, are the rest of the brightest of the synchrotron sources. So as I say, we're not looking at coherent objects, which uh, will be uh, too small and vary too rapidly, and they're not in the remit of our working group. And we're not looking at the faintest uh, synchrotron sources. So for example, some synchrotron emission associated with flare stars and brown dwarfs. Um, so the, the first thing I want to mention, um, that I think there's a couple of issues with the, the stellar mass uh, objects that, that people raise when they're imagining whether or not we could use uh, EHT and NGEHT with them. And those are, first off, does it, is it really bright enough? And the second one is, okay, if it's, if it's bright enough, um, will you be able to image anything? And I'll try and address those two problems in turn. Um, and this, this uh, 
the, the, the next couple of slides that I'm going to show are also relevant to the prospects of doing that flux monitoring. So for a lot of transients, just a general point to make for a lot of transients, monitoring um, or rapid response to, to outbursts often detected at other wavelengths performed at millimeter wavelengths are very rare. And of course that tells you about the very earliest times of the ejector or the jet. So it's very important um, in filling out our understanding before you get to centimeter, centimeter wavelengths. So the figure you see here um, is a few hours of uh, radio and millimeter observations of a black hole X-ray binary called V404 Cygni, which were published by Alex Tetarenko et al. in uh, 2017 now. And you see that at the highest frequency, um, which the highest frequencies, which were 350 and 666 gigahertz, then we're seeing flares of several Janskys. So this is milli Janskys here. The highest flare gets to about seven and a half Janskys. So you can have very, very bright flares from these objects. Now, without very rapid response in some of these objects, it will be hard to catch these flares, but there are a number of objects where you actually get sequences of these events. And if some subset of the array were able to respond on time scales of hours or even days, then that would be adequate to, uh, to uh, 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 catch these sources when they were very submillimeter bright. So what physically is happening when we're seeing these submillimeter flares? Well, I have some interpretation of these data here. So what Alex has done is she tracked uh, events which were seen to peak earliest at 666 gigahertz, and she tracked them through a number of frequencies all the way down to five gigahertz using a, a number of facilities. And what you can do with, with, fairly, for, with fairly reasonable justification is that you can assume that each of the individual peaks, you see the individual frequency uh, is actually due to synchrotron self-absorption. You can apply a, a, a simple uh, interpretation of that and you get the size of the source. So what you see here um, is a set uh, of uh, tracks of different flares. So for example, all the green points, they represent one individual launched event, which we saw peaking at a range of frequencies going from the highest over here to the lowest there. And the sizes is the y-axis, uh, it's the log of the gravitational radii. We can be fairly confident in those. The one thing we're not confident about is actually what is the initial delay here on the x-axis? So the x-axis is variously time, logarithm of seconds. And of course, we, we know with very high precision the, the time interval between peaks, but we don't know actually how much time there was before we saw the first peak after the ejector were physically launched. Um, and in this case here, I'm suggesting that there was a, a very short time uh, between the, the launch of the ejector and the peak at uh, over 600 gigahertz. And here below as the second x-axis is the estimated distance from the black hole as a, as a, again, as a log scale in gravitational radio. And in this particular case, what you see is if the, uh, if the time from launch to the, the very earliest peak was short, then actually what you see uh, as a function of time of the distance of the ejector moving away from the black hole and their physical sizes is something which is actually consistent with an early phase of parabolic expansion followed uh, by a phase of conical expansion, which of course is what the AGN community have been discovering in M87 um, and some other objects. And I put on here the, uh, the resolution of EHT, both in terms of separating the components from the core and physically resolving them. And you can see that in this case, if you didn't resolve any components with EHT, that actually it would be strong support for the parabolic uh, interpretation, but we wouldn't really be able to, to physically uh, measure what the components were doing. If the delay were much longer, so these two plots really encompass the full range here, um, then in fact, the, the expansion of the ejector would have been much close to linear. Um, uh, but in that case, we see that we would actually be able to directly resolve both the proper motions. Sorry, we'd be able to directly resolve the proper motions of the ejector um, at sub millimeter scales, which gives us the very earliest physical measurements of the ejector from stellar mass black holes. So either possibility um, would be very exciting. Now, one of the, the, the second concern that people often throw um, at these stellar mass objects is aren't the proper motions going to be too fast to track? So I've established that the sources are bright enough and I've established that it's moderately likely um, that the components may be resolvable, separable from the black hole uh, uh, um, at the time when they're at their brightest moment to the millimeter emission. But the problem then is the proper motions. However, um, a new technique has recently been developed and deployed on centimeter wavelength VLBI. 
So this is in a paper by Callum Wood et al, who's a student working with James Miller-Jones. And I show um, some epochs of centimeter VLBI imaging here, which were done in a standard way on a stellar mass black hole. So the black hole um, is where the, the cross is marked here. And we know this from a number of other measurements. And you see at two epochs, which, which are separated by a short period of time, that there's a, there's a component moving along this direction. We'll forget about the, the counter jet for now. Uh, and measure, yeah, we could measure the proper motions of this component, and we essentially know that we need something that should have been moving faster. And what Callum did um, is he applied, we had an idea of how fast the faster moving component was moving. Callum applied a method where he shifted the data to account for the, uh, the superluminal motions, uh, which were about four milliard seconds per hour. And he was able to recover this component C here, which was actually moving too fast to be, uh, to be uh, detected in static Im normal imaging, but was recovered via this method. And very interesting for the physics of jets, this faster component must have moved through this slower component um, earlier in the, the jet propagation. Um, so there, there's very strong synergies between what you can do um, with the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes. So essentially with a supermassive black hole using things like the EHT, you can track ejector and you can track the accretion flow and then the, the launch and propagation of jets from essentially event horizon scales out to about 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 RG. And with EHT, you can pick up the moving ejector on scales of about 10 to the 5 RG. And then with facilities, for example, like Meerkat, you can track the ejector all the way to the point that they, they decelerate and terminate in the local medium. So by, by tying together um, the, the AGN and X-ray binaries, you can really see the entire picture from accretion flow to launch to propagation, ultimately termination, which is your best way of estimating the power in the jets. Um, there are a number of other objects which are millimeter bright. So these are fast blue optical transients, which I think are probably going to turn out to be some interesting flavor of supernovae, perhaps centrally, uh, centrally powered. They can last for, for several tens of days as bright objects at sub millimeter wavelengths. So these are SMA detections above 200 gigahertz, where it reached 50 millijanskis. Um, and equally, GRBs have occasionally been detected um, at several tens of millijanskis. So we've been trying to put together um, some uh, use case and engineering constraints uh, for NGEHT. And we're building tables like this, where we're putting classes of objects and how bright they might get and what kind of response times the array might need. And things that we're thinking about and things that everyone should be thinking about for this kind of science is do we need a rapid response mode for NGHT, both in terms of flux, flux monitoring and imaging? Um, and can we do this with subarrays of the telescopes? Okay, so that was it really. I just want to wrap up then and say we have, um, there's a whole range of stellar scale astrophysical transients. So I focused on the stellar mass black holes and their jets, because that ties in most closely with the, the traditional EHT science, but is, is scaled down. Um, and in fact, a lot of these objects will be, will be detectable um, as relatively bright submillimeter sources, and this could possibly be done with an NGEHT subarray. There is a way to image the high proper motion components, which is this method which uh, Callum Wood has called dynamical phase center tracking. And for the closest black holes with jets, which are those in the X-ray binaries, we could track the jets from about 10 to the 5 gravitational radio, which almost perfectly overlaps to the distances to which you can, you can really track in a, in a humanly accessible lifetime, the, the ejector from launch to... to to, to more or less termination for an AGN. So there's very strong synergies between the, the AGN work and the, the stellar mass black hole work. So our requirements, as I said, are rapid response, being able to monitor fluxes and possibly sparse imaging subarrays. Um, we're open to all, we're a very small and friendly group. Uh, we're gonna continue to have uh, uh, relatively uh, regular meetings and try and, uh, try and see how we can push the telescope. So uh, please contact uh, Daryl or myself uh, if you uh, uh, have an interest in this group. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it's uh, fantastic and uh, perfectly on time. Yeah, I think we have time for one or two questions. And uh, Andre, please uh, prepare to, to share your, your, your screen in a moment. So do we have uh, a question for Rob? I have a question. Uh, Sh well, Sh Sridhan, I think uh, you've got your hand up, and and Marshall, uh, we'll 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 put you on deck. 
Uh, okay, uh, thanks. Uh, do you hear me all right? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to point out um, um, in uh, star formation, massive star formation, there are a class of uh, methanol mesas which have recently been discovered related to episodic accretion. Uh, and these are really, really bright. They get up to 1000 Jansky. Of course, these are spectral lines. And uh, based on uh, lower frequency observations, they, they move about a few milliseconds per day. And uh, uh, EHT and NGEHT, if you have the ability to trigger, these are objects that one can go after. You can actually trace these things over hours time scales, and this will be exciting. And they, they seem to be happening of the order of one every year. Uh, so that's kind of suitable. And uh, we just started to discuss this in the, in the New Horizons group, but it has not progressed to a point uh, where it would be presented. But then I just wanted to point out that there is this class of objects too. Uh, so that sounds really exciting. In fact, I think one of the one of the goals was that at some, you know, uh, uh, from time to time, the New Horizons working group and this working group would have joint meetings. So the next time when we do that, I'd be very interested to hear about these objects. Thank you. We should do that, yes. Uh, Andre, do, can we uh, start sharing your slides while yeah. Marshall asks his, asks his question? M Marshall, did you want to ask uh, a question for Rob? I was just, I mean, in technically you could switch the array very rapidly if you wanted to it seems like five or ten minutes would not actually be that you know technically out of the question so the question then i would have is well what does that buy you is how you know how how valuable would one minute versus one hour versus one day be is if have you looked at that sort of trade space there i mean one yes. minute i think it's kind of tough but 10 minutes i think you know if you had a good trigger could be done um, you know uh, that it, it really depends on the objects you're looking at. So some of the some of the most variable objects they're really peaking within minutes. So we've actually had an, uh, an a robotic rapid response mode operating on the Amy Telescope in Cambridge for about a decade now. That's, that's so admittedly that's only at 16 gigahertz. And sometimes we've been lucky enough to get on objects within a few minutes and we've seen from time to time things are already declining from their first flare at a few minutes. Remember, these are stellar scale objects, right? So they, the ejector are far, far smaller than they are in AGN. On the other hand, there are objects like supernovae where we really know that you could be relaxed and, you know, a few days would be fine. But for, for the, the real, the real, the accreting stellar mass objects, then, then very rapid response would be, you know, sometimes at least would be very desirable. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, Marshall. Andre, um, you're take it away. All right. So let me just continue with the presentation of probably the most uh, eclectic science working group. We're squatting on the uh, name of the great NASA mission and being tasked to uh, search high and low for new ideas and broader scope for the NGHT science. And that's uh, it's a very interesting search. But I, I could say it uh, could easily, very easily go astray if you are um, not focusing it on the central issues, then it may then end up with what you see now on the screen. So we tried to avoid that. And what we did is uh, uh, we started with a kickoff on 15th of September and had a series of telecoms, well, actually three of them. And uh, we tried to first pick up from the science themes, which were discussed in the uh, in February meeting, and then introduce any uh, new topics that were actually brought up by a very vibrant community, which is listed here, the telecom participants. And uh, we quickly realized that we need to organize ourselves for uh, because the range of subjects and range of topics was actually quite mind boggling and going from one way to the other uh, of the entire scientific spectrum. And uh, we were not so not so daring as as Shep, showing essentially all of the topics that were introduced or discussed during our telecoms. And instead, we just put them into um, what we call the science performance matrix, uh, similar to what's, uh, what was shown for for other groups. And I think it would be a good idea to merge these presentations of this uh, science performance or performance whatever matrix for uh, scientific uh, topics for the NGHT. And we try to sort of uh, not to go into really comparative discussion, but at least to define, as we were asked by, by Michael several times, to define the most sort of outstanding 
topics to present at this meeting and uh, the topics which would potentially uh, provide this new horizon input or no novel inputs for the scientific uh, subjects for the NGHT. And what we quickly realized that uh, a range of the topics which was presented and proposed was focusing or circling over onto the um, uh, enabling astrometric capabilities at the NGHT. This is the uh, photon ring astrometry or uh, supermassive black hole astrometry, which was proposed and proposed and discussed in great detail by Marshall. Marshall will also give a, a talk about it on the November 4th, on the 4th and the Thursday. And um, applications of astrometric measurements to cosmology and similar to that, the mega maser cosmology projects or ideas and also uh, astrometric measurements of magneta, magnetars, if we can have more than one uh, uh, viable candidate. So these four themes provided a lot of scientific impetus and also pro were sort of basically united by this theme of enabling astrometry at the NGHT. And we see that uh, most of these subjects rely, uh, require relative astrometry, which also implies that we need um, to have multi-frequency receivers and possibly frequency phase transfer in order to enable that because the target objects are not going to be strong enough uh, for, um, um, for like conven conventional astrometric applications. And also the, uh, all of the uh, other variables such as coherence times and phase stability and everything uh, playing against us if we're talking about enabling astrometry at 230 gigahertz. Uh, there are other topics, and some of those would be presented also in, uh, in, a, in a different presentations. So uh, we were discussing extensively astroparticle physics applications, axion and ultralight boson searches, and Yufan Chen will talk tomorrow about it. And also this topic is uh, prominently featured at the Fundamental Physics Working Group, and I think it actually uh, deserves uh, a bit more attention than we have now. It's a sort of side issues or some, one of the issues in both groups. We should probably think of a bit a more deeper discussion because it's certainly not just axions and uh, other boson surges. There's a lot range of um, new astroparticle applications or new physics application, life particle applications. And I think that we may also, similar to what um, Rob was just saying, uh, having a telecom with the transient group, we may want to discuss that probably together with the fundamental physics group at some point. Um, that was very interesting application of planetary radar science and uh, TK will talk about it on November 4th. And uh, we were discussing two more topics, the transients and MWL studies, multi relling studies for um, uh, supermassive black holes and jet physics. This is a very great overlap with the uh, with, with the transient, so this is probably we need to consider, consider as, a, as a joint discussion point for later. And we touched upon, but we didn't have time to go into great details in uh, stellar astrophysics with SIO and methanol misers. And as TK just mentioned, there may be a very interesting uh, applications of those. The SIO misers, I believe, will be, uh, will be discussed by Ilva on November 4th, but this is something for us to continue. As you see, the spectrum of the scientific topics is so broad that uh, it is not easy to, um, uh, to discuss them all in, uh, in, in sufficient degree of detail with this within just three or four meetings. So what comes out of the discussions is that we really think that uh, enabling astrometric applications at the AGHT would be a good way to uh, explore uh, quite unique and very fundamental science but we realize uh, as well that it will most likely uh, impose a quite heavy design and technical requirements on the instruments. So further discussions on both merits, uh, uh, drawbacks and um, trade-offs is certainly needed at this point. So let me just go just very quickly. This, how do we think that we could potentially enable this astrometry at the NGHT? And I think this is the, uh, the um, technique that was in designed and implemented at the uh, at KVN, the simultaneous measurements at four frequencies with the shared optical path receivers, uh, which Maria Lioja will talk tomorrow uh, extensively, would enable us indeed um, just to get the next uh, step on this ladder, uh, the four frequency receiver, which is implemented at uh, KVN and goes up to 130 gigahertz. If we test this technique up to 230 gigahertz, we could achieve um, very good uh, phase noise as shown here in, uh, in, in, this, in, in this formula and the um, 
phase residual phase errors for the uh, frequency um, ref phase reference in experiments. So these two factors will enable both increasing the sensitivity of the measurements at 230 gigahertz and providing sufficient phase stability and, and residual phase errors to really get the um, astrometry going on at higher frequencies at the 230 gigahertz, for instance. And if we do so, then we could uh, apply astrometric measurements to a range of science. First is this photon rings, which we will discuss by uh, Marshall Eubanks. And those are as uh, obvious are most probably arguably most stable morphological features in extragalactic objects and for enabling astrometry or using them as astrometric uh, points we don't even need to resolve them we, it suffices to detect them as point-like features inside sort of larger scale emissions so even for those objects where the um, NGHT will not be able to uh, to really image the shadows or we are already good enough if we can uh, identify photon rings as point, side, point sources. Um, large improvement in positional accuracy is really expected if astrometric capabilities are in, enabled. So we should get 10 micro seconds of better accuracy on measure, measuring these photon rings. But the drawback here is that if we want to use these measurements for um, really like reference frame for ge geodetic or um, the geodetic applications then absolute astrometry required that's a different ball game it's a very difficult and application has to be really considered but there is a large uh, area of, of relative astrometric application for this is track orbits of uh, binary black holes at very small separations this is a very interesting and exciting task and capability and has been discussed also in the, in other groups so this is obviously a similar ideas that popping up in different groups so when you consider again the uh, requirements for astrometry in this case and uh, unique for resolving the uh, um, gravitational wave emitting supermassive black binaries which would be complementary to studies for instance with the um, pta with pulsar time in the range with not quite with lisa but pta and uh, this kind of measurements would certainly uh, would be able to identify and characterize one and the same objects one and the same set of objects it would be very nice um what is also interesting is to if we get this astrometry being possible with the NGHT and uh, 10 micron second accuracy, this would enable, enable a, a whole range of frontline applications for cosmology. We could get yearly parallaxes up to distances of uh, uh, like, uh, probably several megaparsecs. Um, this is the two, two minutes, Andre. Sorry, yeah, yes. We could get proper motions up to distances of. 20 kiloparsecs and larger CMB parallaxes and get the accurate Hubble constant measurements. Uh, so this is a very nice set of astrometric applications coming from, this, from these capabilities. Um, extended to uh, water masers, we get uh, possibilities to, get, to measure positions, radial velocities and accelerations and several features. And as indeed, as Dom um, was, was saying, the, uh, there's a line at 183 gigahertz, which produces very strong masons and line notes uh, 325, 321 gigahertz, which could be used with about 100 millijanski strengths. It's a bit uh, difficult task, but it's a very interesting application because if we can detect these lines, we can get most accurate measurements of Hubble constants in galaxies up to, so you say, some 200 megaparsecs. So with my astrometry is magnetized is another interesting applications for uh, our, our own galaxies and that's uh, interesting because that particular frequency range between three millimeter and month of three millimeter may possibly offer a sweet spot for making this proper motion studies and we can do that for the magneta near, well, near the galactic center that's a very nice um, kinematic information about our own galactic center and uh, the, the properties of, of that, that region so let me just uh, finish that by saying this, this working group is certainly work in progress and we continue with this evaluation analysis um, and we certainly should expand the scope of our work, but also get the cross uh, activities uh, across several working groups together in order uh, to avoid repetitions and uh, excessive repetition of work. But what we have as a preliminary conclusion is that we really think that astrometric capability is one of the very interesting application or very interesting science uh, tools to be implemented at the NGHT. And it needs at the moment, of course, further 
and more detailed evaluation and thorough analysis of various trade-offs and everything. So maybe forming a task force for astrometry with the NGHT is, a, is the right answer to proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre. Fantastic. I think we have time for a couple questions. Um, and, and Dom, please be ready to jump on the screen. So, so in lieu of uh, hands going up, let, let me let me ask a question. Uh, about a decade ago, Mark Reed, Avi Loeb, and I looked at astrometry with uh, millimeter VLBI and concluded we could get to micro arc second precisions, but the chief problem was uh, phase references that were that were within the isoplanetic patch. So, so has there um, been some thought given to? Uh, how to identify and what phase references we might use for, um, you know, d different uh, targets? Well, this is indeed a, a not an easy question. Um, and you need to do careful identification of phase references for that, to take into account structure efficiently um, of, of your calibrators. But uh, for some also some particular aspects of the work, the source frequency phase reference in which Maria Rioja will discuss, describe tomorrow, is, uh, is a very, uh, very efficient way to improve on this, uh, on this problem. Okay, so uh, well, th thank you. Um, Tom, do you wanna, do you wanna get your, your slides up? And Alexander, while that's happening, why don't you ask your question? Uh, hi, hi, Andre. Uh, I need a, how I do to join me to the working group. Uh, I'm very interested in the cosmological astrometry. Uh, very easy. We'll just uh, just write to me probably or send me a email with your address. And that's it. Um, we didn't. Well, I'm not sure. You can also register at the NGHT site for this uh, for this working group and pick up the address from there. Okay, thank you very much. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you again, Andre. Um, uh, Michael just uh, just posted the link to sign up for scientific working groups. So maybe we should get that onto the the Slack and pin it up top. Um, with that, uh, Dom, uh, take it away. All right, thanks, Avery. Just let me know if you either can't see my slides or can't hear me. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that all is well. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to be talking about the uh, the algorithms and inference working group, uh, or or the AI working group as as we've taken to calling it. Uh, so I'm I'm co-coordinating this group along with uh, Katie Bauman, and the uh, primary goal of the AI working group is to serve as a sort of central hub for algorithm development within the NGEHT. Uh, so in that sense, the AI working group is is a bit different from most of the other science working groups that you've heard from earlier today. Uh, because uh, we don't really expect to be driving the science goals uh, of the EH, of the NGHT, but rather uh, we envision that this working group uh, will serve more of a supporting role, uh, helping to develop things like the imaging and, and modeling and, uh, and simulation tools uh, that will be necessary to actually carry out the science goals that are identified by the other groups. Uh, and so if we started to, to get this group off the ground in the last couple of months, um, hasn't always been obvious what the real you know, top science priorities of the NGEHT will be. Uh, so for the time being, we, we've decided to leave it up to the working group members, asking them uh, these two questions that you see here on the slide. So, so one, you know, what do you think are the most important algorithms? And, and, and two, what do you think are the most exciting algorithms uh, for the NGEHT to be pursuing a development of? Um, and, and, so, and so we posed these questions to the working group members uh, during the kickoff working group meeting. And, and, and then we took the responses to these questions and tried to sift out some common themes. Uh, and ultimately, we settled on, on the six different topics shown on the slide here. Uh, and we organized them into six different focus groups, uh, uh, one, one based on each of these topics. Uh, the leads for the focus groups are listed here. And, and, and these folks have been selected both on the basis of, of their domain expertise, but also uh, you know, based on their expressed interest in the, in the topic at hand. And so for the remainder of this presentation, what I'm, what I'm gonna to try to do is just walk briefly through each of these groups and, 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 and touch, on, uh, touch on, on, on the goals and ongoing activities uh, for those groups. 
Um, so first up is uh, what we're calling static source reconstruction. So, so this group's being led by Andrew Shale, Jose Gomez, and Sarah Esaun. Uh, and the idea here is that, is that this group is focused on the development of things like imaging and modeling algorithms that aim to perform source structure reconstruction from NGEHT-like data. Uh, there are a number of dimensions in which the NGEHT source reconstruction problem is expected to be uh, richer than what the EHT has to contend with, uh, because the NGHT is going to observe in multiple frequencies, and, and it'll be sensitive to a much broader range of intensities and, and spatial scales. And so the algorithmic developments coming from this focus group uh, will be aimed at tackling those challenges. Um, so for instance, things like having high dynamic range imaging across a large field of view, these are going to be necessary for capturing the M87 jet launching region and tying it to the horizon scale shadow structure. And being able to reconstruct the same source across multiple frequencies uh, it will, would enable things like uh, robust recovery of spectral index information, which, which can then be used to constrain the properties of the emitting plasma. <clears throat> uh, and, and this slide here is just showing a couple examples of ongoing work uh, for this group. So on the left is a nice demonstration from Andrew Shale uh, showing some multi-frequency imaging of an M87-like simulation across both 86 and 230 gigahertz, where we can see the improved spectral index recovery that comes from using both of these frequencies simultaneously. And then on the right is, is a very early example of some multi-scale imaging work being carried out within one of these regularized maximum likelihood frameworks, uh, where in this case, there's an adaptive pixel grid being used to, to substantially speed up the imaging process. Um, okay, so, so next, uh, we want to talk briefly about you know, moving from static to dynamic source reconstruction. Uh, the, the leads for this focus group are Antonio Fuentes, Aviad Levis, and Alex Tedarenko. Um, and, and the focus here is on developing reconstruction techniques for, for dynamic sources, uh, meaning sources that are, that, are, that are changing their structure uh, with time. Uh, and so the obvious science beneficiary here is Sajay Star, uh, which is known to be variable on very short timescales compared to typical observing runs. And, and the coverage, the, the Fourier coverage, the UV coverage on these short timescales will necessarily be sparser and it will necessarily have lower signal to noise than the coverage that you would obtain for more static sources like M87 across uh, a much longer observing period. And so if the, if the NGHT aims to make movies of the accretion flow around Sagi star, which, which it absolutely does, then it will need to have capable algorithms for doing so. Um, but you know, that said, Sag star is not the only source of interest for dynamical reconstructions. Um, there are other AGN targets that are known to vary on roughly day timescales at NGEHT resolutions. Um, and even some of these non-AGN sources like, like microquasars and others that we just heard about um, will be possible NGEHT targets that are expected to exhibit rapid variability. Uh, and so here are a couple examples again. On the left, we have um, three different versions of how a dynamic reconstruction algorithm might work um, using either parameterized modeling, um, reasonably non-parametric imaging, or, or, or maybe a combined approach that parameterizes a portion of the information, something like a, you know, maybe a flow field in this case. And then on the right here, I have to play this video. Um, on the right here, we actually have a, a dynamic reconstruction, a real one of one of these microquasars, this V404 Cygni object that I think we already heard about. And this is courtesy of James Miller Jones and Alex Tarenko. As you can see, one of these you know, objects really evolving on, on minute timescales. Okay, so, so on to the next focus group. Um, we, we just discussed static and dynamic reconstructions. Um, uh, we wouldn't want to add another temporal dimension, uh, but, but we, there is another spatial dimension we can add. And so we're moving on to talk about some 3D accretion flow reconstruction. And as the name of this group suggests, the, the, the 3D accretion flow reconstruction group uh, is interested in developing algorithms that could be used to determine the three-dimensional distribution of material around black holes using NGEHT data. And this group is being led by Aviad Levis, Daniel Palumbo, and Paul Tita. Um, and the primary motivation behind this kind of strategy is that uh, one can really get much more directly at physical parameters of interest in the system um, with this kind of 3D uh, reconstruction compared to something like the, the two-dimensional geometric modeling that was carried out uh, for the EHD uh, publications on M87. And by forward, by, by, I would say forward modeling the accretion flow itself within the space-time uh, that you think it's living in, you can cut out intermediate steps of things like trying to translate sky plane features to physical parameters. And, uh, and probably the archetype of this kind of modeling that's been done to date is, is, is semi-analytic RIAF work. And an example of that is shown, is shown here on the right, uh, courtesy of Paul Tita, 
and is compared against uh, an appropriate GRMHD simulation. But th there are additional efforts currently underway to perform you know, similar kinds of re 3D reconstruction. And a couple examples are shown on this slide. On the left here is some work that, uh, that Aviad Levis is leading in which his algorithm uh, dynamically allocates emission locations within the space-time using a, a neural network whose weights are, are then trained to, to best match some input data. And on the right is a, is a separate effort from Daniel Palumbo. This is called Kerbam, uh, which leverages semi-analytic ray tracing uh, within the Kerr metric to, to produce uh, you know, many sample images and explore posterior distributions of the underlying physical parameters. Uh, okay, so, so just went through three groups that are focused on algorithms that, that are really informed by, you know, in various ways by, by, uh, by our physical expectations, but which ultimately are, uh, are aiming to interface directly with data. Um, but those physical expectations themselves uh, must come from somewhere. And that's where this next focus group, Astrophysical Simulations, enters in. Uh, so this group's being led by Razi Amami Maybadi, uh, Sarab Kumar, and Yosuke Mizuno. Um, and this group's really aiming to, uh, to focus on the sorts of first principles numerical simulations that drive our theoretical understanding of these systems that NGEHT is hoping to observe. And there are a, a wide variety of simulations that fall under this, this rather general heading, including those like GRMHD and GR ray tracing uh, that, are, that are already prominent within the EHD collaboration, um, but also uh, thinking about including things like you know, plasma methods like PIC and, and, and even numerical relativity methods for dynamical space times such as would be relevant for binary black hole systems. And I think the motivation for simulations like these is, uh, is fairly self-evident as they, as they do typically inform our, our a priori understanding and expectations for the systems that we're aiming to observe. Um, and if we, if we want to be testing out our physical theories, we, we do need to be able to translate the predictions of those theories into observable signatures. So for the NGEHT, uh, this means that we need to have the ability to simulate a variety of both accretion and space-time physics. Uh, but there's also this awareness that, that our existing simulations are limited in a number of ways insofar as, as how physically realistic they are. And so pushing the state of the art forward on those as well is going to be one of the goals of this focus group. Um, and here are a couple examples of the sorts of work that, that, that they're thinking about. So on the left here are, are some images that are produced by Christian Fromm for an M87-like system subject to different assumptions about the electron heating prescription, uh, and which we can see here uh, results in uh, sort of different observed emission, uh, the, the region gets lit up differently and so appears different on the sky. And then on the right uh, are examples of, of several black hole shadow images produced by Yosuke Mizuno um, in a variety of different space times, notably including um, some alternatives to, to Kerr. And this demonstrates how, how these uh, different choices can modify the observed source morphology. Two minutes. Um, thank you, Avery. So, so the area operations focus group uh, so let's, let's, let's move forward. So the next group is, uh, is backing away from the physical theory and considering just the very practical question of how we might best operate an array like the NGEHT. This array operations focus group is being led by Joshua Lin, Alex Raymond, and Hassan. Uh, its aim is to develop algorithms for things like making decisions for whether and when to trigger observations and for selecting the optimal locations and properties of new sites that can be added to the array. Um, the site selection question is an immediately relevant one because the NGEHT currently doesn't have a finalized reference design. And so determining which site and station combinations can optimize across a variety of considerations, such as UV coverage, baseline sensitivity, imaging fidelity, total cost, et cetera, is thus an area of active ongoing effort. And, and, and because the NGHT will probably observe much more often than the EHT does, and it will target many more sources, schedule optimization will become even more important. And so having algorithms for things like observation triggering and rapid quality assessment will help with scheduling and with creating feedback loops for further refining the, the optimization. Um, just another couple of examples, and I'll, I'll just go quickly. On the left is an example set of figures for some uh, uh, site selection work led by Hassan, in which he developed this encoder decoder scheme for determining the sets of stations uh, that are necessary to maximize image fidelity while retaining, you know, as, as while remaining as parsimonious as possible in overall array configuration. And on the right is this schematic diagram that, that's showing the thought process behind how an observation scheduling algorithm might, might, might work. Um, all right, so final focus group is, is, uh, is tackling something of a meta problem, uh, this critical question of how we do everything I just said in, in a way that's computationally scalable. So, uh, so this group's being led by Kazu Akiyama, CK Chan, and Greg Lindell, and aims to establish an infrastructure or best practice for enabling algorithms that can leverage large and increasing amounts of computational horsepower across the full extent of NGEHT algorithmic needs. And, uh, and so I apologize, I don't have any flashy visuals to highlight this work. Um, you know, the motivation for it really, though, could, could hardly be clearer. 
the NGEHT is expected to handle, you know, more than a, you know, a data volume that's more than an order of magnitude larger than, uh, than what the EHT has to deal with and, and aims to do so much more frequently. So that means that things like correlation, calibration, all downstream processing, all these things are going to become much more computationally burdensome. And so having a framework in place to do things like containerize software, stage it on a cluster or on a cloud computing platform, and then distribute the necessary computations efficiently uh, will be necessary to avoid running into severe computational bottlenecks at any of a number of stages. And then doing all of that in a manner that's relatively agnostic as to the specific task that any one piece of software is carrying out, well, uh, as you know, that's the difficult task that this group is setting out to solve. So uh, I realize I'm running long on time. So, so with that, I'll just leave my summary slide up here uh, and I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Dom. Uh, so uh, I think we have time for one or two questions for Dom and, and Peter, um, you, you are on deck. So, so if, if, uh, if there are no forthcoming questions, uh, let me ask one, which is of the, of the set of algorithmic developments that, that you identified, what do you think the top one or two uh, most important for assessing the NGHT uh, architecture are? are? Are any of these in the critical path to determining what the NGHT has to look like? Um, and if so, what's the, what's the most important one? Well, I think the group focused on array operations is, is the relevant one for answering these kinds of questions, right? They're, they're really thinking about things like how, you know, what, what's the decisions that affect the array architecture or the array operation? Um, you know, how, how can we make sure that, that we are optimizing those decisions before actually needing to, to finalize any, right? So because this is, this is, you know, the big question right now for the NGHT is what's the array going to look like? And, and you know, how, how is that going to how is that going to optimize the science downstream? I think this is the working group that's, or the focus group that's, that's, uh, that's really invested most heavily in that question. This is number five here on the slide. Do, do, do you see things like the dynamic uh, source reconstruction or, or uh, astrophysical simulations um, maturing uh, sufficiently to bear on uh, the work from, from your fifth subgroup? Yeah, so I think that, you know, the, a, a very clear and cogent definition of the science priorities um, ought to be the, the natural um, uh, sort of input into the metrics that determine what the optimal array looks like. And so if, if the top science priority is a dynamic reconstruction of a source or a particular set of sources, then yeah, that, I think that needs to be folded in at some level. All right. So uh, can, I, can, I get, uh, can I get Peter to start sharing his slides? And while that's going on, uh, Shep, please go ahead. Tom, just a quick one. When you have a static image, I can understand how figures of merit can be pretty straightforwardly determined to tell whether you're close to the truth image or not. Have you guys made any headway on understanding how you tell whether a video is a good representation of the input video? Um, so, so I think the, there hasn't been a ton of explicit work on that yet within this working group. I, to, off the top of my head, it doesn't sound qualitatively any different between a static or a video. I mean, you, you can determine a metric just as easily either way, and it's going to be prone to similar similar uncertainties. So, so I, I don't see a ton of difference. I think it's going to be a lot harder to, to by certain metrics, get a video to look right. But I don't think uh, there's, there's any conceptual hurdle, or not a big one, between uh, static and, re and dynamic comparing a ground truth to some prediction for a ground truth. Okay, we should talk about it offline. I, I, there are different uh, coherent motions that might be locked onto that are different from pixel to pixel matching of the of the truth mm -hmm. image. That's what I was getting at. But but interesting. Thanks. So, um, Shep, I think I think you have led us perfectly into our final presentation on history, philosophy, and culture with a discussion of uh, NGHT epistemology. What does it mean for a movie to be right? Uh, so with that, Peter, um, you you were sharing. Now you're now you're uh, back into I think uh, your your slide development uh, window. Please Sorry, take it can away. you can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. I can. Good. So one of the exciting many exciting features of the NGHT is that we hope to integrate considerations about the history of 
astronomy and, and, and science more broadly, black holes, uh, into the work that's being done, the philosophical considerations that are raised by black holes and by the kinds of inquiry that we're engaged in about the epistemology, that is to say, how we gain and secure knowledge about the objects that we're studying and about the cultural embedding of this large scale and long term enterprise that we're embarking on with the NGHT. So by bringing this in from the beginning and having it integrated with the scientific uh, work as it develops, both having the scientific work inform the kinds of questions we ask of history, philosophy, and the broader cultural matrix, uh, and then vice versa, having questions of philosophy, of ethics, and culture feed into how we do things in the EHT, in the NGHT will be, uh, we think, uh, both on the scientific side and on this other side, both uh, very mutually productive. We've divided the work, and this is cohort, this working group, which is one of the, I think we have eight total scientific working groups, uh, is led by Tiffany Nichols and me. Um, Tiffany's finishing a remarkable uh, PhD dissertation on looking at the relationship of LIGO to the lands and noise and signals uh, that they provoke. Uh, the, and so I, this, everything that I'm saying really comes back to this broader group that, uh, that, we're, that, that, we're, that Tiffany and I are, are pursuing. The four HPC focus groups are collaboration and outreach, and I'll discuss those in a moment, algorithms and visualization, which will tie into what you just heard, um, uh, citing and culture, and we'll talk about that, and the foundations uh, of, of physics group, of black holes group that we've been running for some time now, and that will, I hope, interact in a productive way with the questions that we're raising at the NGHT. A collaboration and outreach um, numbered arbitrarily as focus group one uh, involves trying to understand what large scale collaborations do and to raise questions about what it means to have a globally distributed set of equipment and instruments of analysis. Uh, the, uh, this kind of work, the HT and then the NGHT uh, that, that, that builds upon it uh, is different. It doesn't have a, a single um, paneled room that is its headquarters. It's truly distributed across the world as we've seen in the maps that we've discussed earlier in this meeting. And how can we learn from older forms of collaboration in astronomy, but also in the long history of particle physics and the space sciences, which have integrated scientists from around the world with also a major contribution from the kind of engineering that is so central to everything we do on the NGHT. Associated with this growth of large scale science are a connected set of questions about epistemology, about governance, uh, about coordination, how, how, for instance, do we want a collaboration that's growing already in this meeting to north of 400 to 500 people come to conclusions and how should it? How then does such a group address the wider interested public? I don't just mean by this, uh, who acts as a spokesperson on any particular subject, although that's also important, um, but how do we find new forms uh, by which to present these results to the public. Uh, and if we're gonna be asking the kind of questions that we are of governments around the world to support a massive extension and expansion of this project, we need to involve the public as well as the decision makers at the scientific agencies and government. We're lucky enough to, on Friday to be hearing from uh, Matthew O'Dowd, Becky Smethers, Derek Muller, and Richard Anantua, all of whom have had very important roles in thinking about outreach, but not just in the kind of traditional outreach forms uh, that are involved with modifying curricula, which of course is important, but also the wider world of social media, of YouTube, of filmmaking, and of other cultural forms that I think we're only beginning to touch upon. We'll have a very small sample of this, uh, if, 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 I, if I may, and saying we're, we'll see a, a short animated film that I, uh, I'll be discussing with uh, various folks, including um, some of our own on, on Friday as well. The second focus group 
uh, is on algorithms and visualization. And here, there's a long development in the history and philosophy of science around imaging and what it means. And we'd like to sort of join that with the associated forms of data, statistics, and theoretical physics forms of representation that are going to be explored by the uh, AI group, as it's coming to be known. Uh, our focus here will be on the NGHT itself, of course, inter alien enterprise that must develop a whole new set of novel means for data analysis and image production. And so as we reflect on the philosophy of algorithmic imaging, how does this bear on the long history of visualization in the sciences? What forms of argument can we carry over from the EHT and what dramatically new forms are we going to need? You've already heard mention of some of the ambitious projects to model in three dimensions, the accretion flow and so on. What new modes of reasoning will come into play with the expanded network and UV coverage that we aim for, dynamic imaging, to really think about how we assess movies? Uh, I think we're only begun to scrape the surface of these considerations so far. And they're gonna be terribly important as we develop new metrics and new ways of assessing the verisimilitude of the movies that we make. This group is going to be coordinated monthly with the AI group. Uh, and as in all these groups, we'll be in close contact with the other working groups as we move forward. The third focus group is on sighting and culture. Uh, Jess Dempsey and Tiffany Nichols will be leads on this uh, and here, this engages with some questions that bear directly and immediately on how we think about site selection, so crucial for the future of the NGHT. And that involves thinking hard and carefully and responsibly about the political cultural place of astronomy. Manifestly citing the relationship of telescopes and their infrastructures to the communities in which they reside have proven controversial. We've seen that. We only need to think of the 30 meter telescope and the passionate protests that famously and affecting us shut down operations at the Hawaiian uh, summit of Mauna Kea. We're fortunate indeed to hear tomorrow, that is to say Tuesday from Jess Dempsey, who's been very involved and tremendously committed to these questions and Larry Kimura, who's played an absolutely central role in the animation and, and distribution of Hawaiian, the Hawaiian language, uh, who's thought hard, who, who gave us a Hawaiian name, Poehi, for the M87 black hole. Uh, I think it, it's a real privilege to hear from them and their reflections tomorrow on what the, how we might get started with this reasoning. But we invite people to all of these groups. If you're interested, please email uh, me and, and, and Tiffany Nichols. We'll also be distributing a uh, a, a sign up mechanism, a poll to start getting some of these groups uh, meeting more consistently. We hope to convene working groups to discuss with the wide cultural reach, how we could do citing in a better way, starting at the beginning, not building and then asking questions, but involving communities, learning from the cosmological and, uh, and, and long standing historical views that local cultures have about the summits and the skies, uh, for all too long, these have ended in uh, th these relationships between astronomers and the communities have ended in misunderstanding and conflict. And this group will be working closely with the technical siting working group within the NGHT. But we hope if we can do this right, it could have an impact beyond the precincts of the NGHT. It could help. It could help lead astronomy into a more harmonious and productive and exciting uh, period um, in the future. The final group, uh, this is led by uh, Jamie, sorry, not James, Jamie Elder and Martin LeSeward. Um, and uh, here we have a longstanding group. It's been meeting for four or five years now on the philosophy of, of black holes uh, at the, that, that's been grounded at the Black Hole Initiative uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but it's not limited to that. We have the majority of participants are from all over the world. And it's coordinated now by Jamie and, and Martin, um, and I think has been tre tremendously exciting. We've looked at questions of modeling, of singularities, of black hole thermodynamics, uh, space-time stability, uh, the philosophy of observation, of causality, as well as the relationship of mathematical and other modes of understanding black holes. 
We're right now in the midst of an exceedingly interesting series on uh, the CARE solution by Martin Lesourd, uh, joining mathematics and physics in a fascinating way. So all of these efforts are really designed to help give dimensionality and a broader cultural, technical, philosophical, and historical location of this program to which we're all so committed in building an NGHT, doing it in the best way we can, uh, and learning and making it as fun and engaging as we possibly can make it. Uh, all of these working groups are completely open. We'd like to have, invite you to participate uh, in the ones that, that intrigue you. And we intend to have each of them will be, of course, in contact with corresponding uh, other members, uh, other groups within the scientific working group structure. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one question before we uh, take our, our final coffee break and head into our final session. Does anybody have a, um... well, well let, me, let me ask a question. So, so Peter, I think you, you described a number of uh, you know, critical philosophical, uh, uh, philosophical questions to be sorted by, by horizon imaging uh, telescopes generally. And, and um, I'm wondering, what do you think um, is the is the most important one that you listed uh, prior to you know the the array design congealing for NGHT? Well, I mean, I think that there are different dimensions of urgency. I think that getting started on citing and joining these questions, these broader cultural questions, to the technical ones as we choose and begin to be in correspondence. I mean in engagement with communities is very important. We wanna do that right. We wanna learn and figure out the principles of action. What can be, you know, there's some things that'll be entirely specific to one site and others that will be general best practices as we go forward. And part of that is learning to, to respect and to learn, to really to learn from the people that live near and on and, and have views about the various sites where we'll be uh, we, we would like to observe. I think that these big foundational questions are very important. I think they may activate our attention in certain ways, you know, as we begin to choose to choose questions and to understand that. I, I, I think how we run our collaboration is important. What, what should be our mode of decision-making about when we actually are ready to go to press? And, and what does that mean? We have a, this is, I think, the most distributed the NGHT will be the most distributed form of scientific collaboration in the history of science. We have an opportunity to think about this in new ways without a fancy headquarters single office that resembles the headquarters of say CERN, uh, which has a location. And uh, you know, there's a, a central desk and a central office at a central place. And we're, we're much more distributed. I think that's exciting. Um, and, and we should think hard about it. Those are some of the things I think are most important. Well, fantastic, Peter. Thank you. Um, and thank all the, let me thank all the speakers in this session. Uh, this was a, a wonderful summary of the work that's ongoing um, and uh, will help feed into our, our exercise of trying to figure out how to build this in the coming days. Uh, with that, why don't I, uh, let me close the session and uh, we will be back at, uh, uh, I, I believe, on the hour um, for an invited talk by Torsten Enslin and then, and then site updates. So thank you, everybody. I uh, will see you in just over 10 minutes.